Okay, everyone. Um, thank you for coming and joining this webinar. Uh, this is Top Ways to Prepare Your Business for Web3. I'm Callan. I'm a reporter at The Block covering NFT, gaming, and the metaverse. And we've got a really exciting webinar for you for the next hour with some really interesting guests. So I'm going to start off by letting them introduce themselves. Uh, should we kick off with Austin? Hi there. Yes, uh, my name is Austin. I'm one of the co-founders at QuickNode. We make blockchain infrastructure easy for companies. So if you need to get access to any of the 15 blockchains we support, uh, we are able to provide that on demand. Awesome, thanks. Omar? Hey everyone, my name is Omar Basali, uh, founder and CEO of uh, Center. Uh, we uh, provide developer tools for crypto builders. What we do is we make it so that um, instead of spending, you know, two, three months to build a minimum viable product of a crypto product, you can do it in just a couple of lines of code, get to market faster and just ship things uh, sooner for your users. Thank you. Uh, Nick. Hi, I'm uh, Nick Swinmer, the founder and CEO of the Hellebore Broadcasting Company. So we launch uh, consumer uh, games, brands, um, uh, game Play Hellebore, which is the first uh, NFT powered uh, sports prediction game, and then launch community owned brands along with that. And last but not least, Sandy. Hello, everybody. My name is Sandy Carter, and I am uh, the SVP of um, our business development at Unstoppable Domains. And if you don't know Unstoppable Domains, you must. Uh, Unstoppable Dom Domains is a digital identity for Web3. So with that domain, first of all, you don't have to pay gas fees. You don't have to subscribe. You own it. And then you can use that digital identity to travel with you through the metaverse, through DeFi applications. It really serves as your identity. You own your identity and you own your data. So uh, really excited to be here. Um, thank you so much for inviting me as well. Awesome. And I almost forgot a little bit of housekeeping. So the way I'm planning to structure this is we're going to start off by talking a little bit about why Web3 matters for businesses before going into a bit more detail on how to get into it. And then we'll have 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. You can ask questions uh, using the Q&A function. It's at the bottom right hand of your screen. So let's get straight into it. Uh, big question. Why does Web3 even matter for businesses? Who wants to take it? Mm. I can start. Um, I think that Web3 is crucial for businesses as we move forward. Um, you know, if I look at Web2, the data is owned by companies. And I think that that puts a big risk and a big distrust on consumers throughout the world. So for me, the big difference between Web2 and Web3 is ownership. Um, so for businesses, many businesses today are looking at how they manage their data, how they control their data, what they do with their data, and users at the same time wanna be able to own that data. They wanna be able to know where that data is going. They wanna know who's using it, how they're using it, when they're using it. And all of that is possible in a Web3 world. And that for me is a lot of power to give a business. It does disrupt businesses. It, it has them do things differently. But I think in the end goal, if you're customer obsessed, this is the right direction for your customers. And in the end game provides a lot more value for those customers as they move forward as well into the next generation of the internet. Um, anyone else that wants to take that question? I think I agree with Sandy on the long-term view. I think in the short term, a lot of businesses can benefit from Web3 just by uh, augmenting their customer profiles, right? So if you have some data in a CRM about your customer base, enriching it with all of the uh, information about their Web3 profile is probably something that's pretty valuable for them. Yeah, I think, I think it also allows... Um, you know, even non-technical companies to know who their customers are. You know, if you're a, a clothing brand, you don't know who who owns your shirt or the pair of shoes, right? So you can use Web3 to 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 understand who at the moment, um, you know, owns an item from your brand. And then I think on a, from, you know, gaming perspective, it gives you a, a way to transfer some tangible asset 
to your users and let them build value on their own. Um, take that outside of your ecosystem if they need to. So I think it's just a it's just a really good way for brands to add to brands and companies. You know, there's there's a way to add it to any any brand, any company um, to either learn more or empower more. So that's uh, exciting. I think I'd love to one. Jump um, in. Oh, oh yes. Yeah, sorry, I was going to say, and one, one other thought on on that is that one thing that's really interesting about a lot of businesses is that when you look at the distribution of fans of uh, you know their customers and how engaged each customer is, very often we start to see these distributions where like you have a small subset of users that are extremely extremely engaged, um, and you have more users who are becoming more engaged, but you have this concentration of people who are really your true fans. One thing that I think is interesting about Web3 is that because it's permissionless, because it's decentralized, there are almost no boundaries and it becomes so much easier as a business owner, as a business operator to see who, who those true fans actually are. Um, it gives your true fans the opportunity to really engage with your brand, to uh, do things you don't even realize they, they actually could do. Um, and it's great in terms of in terms of evangelism and just attracting those people and giving them you know the white space to do more and really help evolve your brand as it grows so uh yeah it's 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 great for existing customers and it's great for empowering customers that are already uh yeah that are already your 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 big fan building off of that uh, omar i do see a huge difference in the community so i think that's what you're getting at if you are uh, a company the community on web3 is so strong uh, in fact i like to say you know the project is the community and the community is the project so uh you know my previous company amazon web services we'd always talk about customer obsession this is customer obsession to the extreme because you're actually doing your roadmap with your customer, your community. Um, you're building things with them. You're hearing from them like daily. Everybody can hear from them. So I do see that strong community play too as a value point for companies that are looking at Web3. And I guess what stage are we at in terms of Web3 adoption in the business space? early stages for sure right you know like there's there's still so many web 2 and traditional enterprises that are just at the very beginning phases of adopting crypto in their business one um yeah i i i agree 100 percent, and i i think to drive that point home uh here's a good metaphor like i think it's it's uh one one good way to compare like web 3 and its potential uh, impact is to think about what the internet did to businesses back in the late 90s. And my favorite comparison to give is uh, we're so early in the cycle. Imagine that if you wanted to put up a, a website for your business, simple, you know, about us page with their phone number and address. And the prerequisite to doing that was you had to index the entire internet, just index every single page on the web, get data on every single page, and then you can put up a person, a page for your business. That's sort of where we are right now. And that's sort of some of our mission, which is so that you don't have to do that. And instead, you can go from idea to shipped very, very quickly. And just the fact that these opportunities still exist and nobody has done them really, really well shows you that like we're still in the very early innings of what this could actually be. And we think that by reducing that friction, we'll help accelerate development, uh, progress, and just help people make more cool things. Yeah, I agree. I, I like to say we're in the dial-up phase. If people remember the dial-up for the internet, so Armour was going for indexing. I'm going to go for the dial-up. We're super early. Um, you know, it's still hard, right? That's why we don't have a lot of mass adoption. I, I If I was starting a new company today, I would do something on the UX and UI. Um, the tech can be expensive. Like I would love to put everything on chain, um, but it's expensive. But even though we're really early, I would say, uh, you know, I would make sure people also hear that, um, you know, this space is real, like there are real things happening today. I'm already starting to see disruption of company and markets, and there are a gazillion opportunities that exist out there. So while we are early, we're not so early that we're not actually working and it's not already disrupting. Uh, I mean, just look at, at Walmart. I was chatting with Walmart yesterday. You know, they put up the metaverse. They had 95 million people come into the metaverse, which is built on Web3. 
I mean, those are phenomenal numbers. So, you know, I think we are early, but we are seeing real actions, real disruptions and real opportunities. Is the Walmart one you're referring to the Roblox they launched? Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Um, which is kind of like a good segue because I guess we're talking about this quite generally. Um, it would be interesting to sort of get some examples from everybody about brands or projects they think are kind of doing well in this space and that other businesses could learn from. Um, I don't know who wants to start. Uh, Nick? I think we can learn from from anyone that's here, right? If we go back to where are we? It's like there's a party that starts at eight. You know, and we're, we're the ones that showed up at seven just because we, we got the time wrong and we walk in. It's really awkward at first. There's not many people there. But then, you know, you talk to whoever's there because that's who's there. And then by the end of the night, you have some bond with those with those early people. And you kind of uh, it's just a different different vibe. Right. So I think whether it's, you know, everyone's just experimenting. There's brands at scale that obviously can, you know, put something out and get a larger total number of people to try it. And then there's brands just starting right into Web3 um, with very small user bases that are still trying things that are just as exciting, right? And so it's kind of that, I think I think we can learn from everyone. I, I, haven't, I haven't met anyone who I've spoken to um, in any capacity related to it that didn't have something interesting to say um, because they're, they're curious enough, excited enough to jump in early to a space where there's a ton of possibilities, right? I mean, back to the analogy, I think it's like, if you, if you took, uh, like, tr like traditional brands and like there was a wholesale model, right? And some started a website early and some waited until it was like direct to consumer. There's no chance it's going to, it's going to hurt our, our wholesale sales. And this is just that next, that next step. So I'm, I'm looking at it as like, I can learn from anyone. I'm, I'm the, and I'm hoping that's true, right? Because I'm the little guy that like is, is starting from scratch. You know, no, no one's coming to say, Hey, I see you're so, you're so big already, or you're doing all these things. Um, and so I think that's the exciting part. There's times where you can kind of restart, you know, you can, you can, by being curious, establish yourself at the beginning and, and you can be doing something that's really interesting to someone much larger than you or much smaller than you or the same as you. So a really roundabout long-winded answer to just basically say, um, I should have just said everyone. And then that would have, uh, that would have got the same point across. <laughs> It's um, I actually I, I, I want to I, I want to speak to that actually as well. I was wondering, can, can I actually share my screen for a second? Because I, I, I think this is a uh, see if I can actually share this for a second. A few weeks ago, I was uh, using I, I was I was just like looking around at like some data that was being indexed. And I discovered this this random collection of all of all things. It's called like the non fungible Olive Gardens project. And I did a little bit of research on it, and I thought it was really, really interesting because someone essentially tried to tokenize all of the Olive Garden locations in the United States and put them on chain. I thought it was kind of, kind of silly, but kind of cool at the same time. And what I think is really big about this, let me stop sharing my screen. What's cool about this is that if you think about brands, companies trying to do things online. It generally takes a lot of upfront investment. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of budget. It's so cool that a company could actually just try and do something like this and see what happens. It kind of makes it possible so that companies can iterate quickly, try things. Many of these things will fail and that's actually okay, but the cost of failure is so low. Um, so I think that when it comes to... Um, thinking about which brands succeed when they do things in Web3 or which projects succeed, it tends to be ones that can go from, you know, an idea to having a V1 or a V2 of it done relatively quickly. So I think to answer the question, it's just like, I think any project will succeed as long as it, as long as it moves quickly enough and speaks to enough users and just gets things done. Um, and it just cuts out so many of the other things that previously did exist. So companies that are iterative projects that just, you know, get something out quickly, you just make it better, 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 and, and talk to users. So yeah. I, I think there's also the, oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, it's also the blend, right? Everyone has to jump in at a different point. Like if you were, you know, you can't, a lot of companies can't go all in on Web3. You wouldn't want to make such a dramatic shift and go all in, but, but there's plenty of opportunity. Um, like the Olive Garden example, just kind of, dip your toes whether and 
And that's that's interesting on a couple of levels, right? Because that could inspire someone like Olive Garden to think about what they could do. But it also inspires, you know, anyone creative to say, oh, how could I interact with a brand that I enjoy in a way that like could A, increase my relationship with them or enhance my relationship with them and B, be valuable to them. And then it could just create this, you know, create so much opportunity. So I think it's um, it's just we get, you know, the, the hardest part is not diving all in or diving head first in an empty pool, right? You got to jump into it. And, and it's like, and then if you're, if you're this tall, you can jump into this much water. If you're this tall, you can't. So it's depending where you are, you have to figure out like what's the right amount of Web3 to right now put into your business or what amount of resources to put into it. Um, so. And just one fun example that I'll give you. Um, I was just at a, a, actually the crypto business conference, the shirt I have on today, and they had the pizza dowel there. And it's a crazy example, but it just, you know, kind of shows that experimentation here is pretty cool. So pizza dowel, um, there are independent pizzeria is in every city and every world, but they don't have the same access to tech as the big pizza chains. So the pizza dowel form for all of these independent pizzerias around the world to gain some power in their supplier relationships and buying technology, really to exercise that financial power just like a big pizza chain has. And uh, it was really fascinating. So they threw a global pizza party to celebrate independent pizzerias. They created an NFT a month later. They had uh, they created a pizza box that would contain the pizza. It raised 330 ETH. Um, and because the trust that the DAO was able to build up with its network, um, all the proceeds from the launch went to uh, to this free pizza in all these different countries so people could try it out. It was $300,000 worth of free pizzas. Um, so why do I love that example? I love that example because I think that DAOs or a distributed autonomous organization are going to really grow up. And I think people are experimenting with them right now. So I love that example because it's an example of how independent businesses can come together um, ex execute on a strategy, get organized, and then create something that has a really interesting outcome. It's not as sexy as like Nike and their tennis shoes or, you know, what Walmart has done, but I think equally as powerful uh, in the space as well. Yeah, that's a good point because I think a lot of the time we focus on like what, you know, big corporations are doing, you know, Pepsi NFT drop, things like that. And we forget that there's also, you know, the giving power to sort of independent businesses as well, right? Mm -hmm. And globally, like it's not just a US thing or a, you know, or a thing in Europe, it's like global thing, right? And they brought together all these global businesses. I think that's a, a real power is that power of community again. Definitely. Um, I wanna go back to adoption a little bit. Um, because when you're in the space, you know, you can talk with people about NFTs, about DAOs, and, you know, people know what you're talking about. Uh, for me, my kind of weather vane of what, you know, people not in the space know about is my mom. So um, <laughs> when I kind of try to explain things like NFTs and DAOs to her, she's just like, what? No. Um, and I think that's still something that a lot of people think, right? For Web3 to be successful for businesses, there also has to be an aspect of onboarding more people, right? Um, do businesses have a role to play in that or do you think that has to come from somewhere else? Uh, I can, um, oh yeah, good, good. Yeah, I, I think that it's a shared responsibility among all participants in the ecosystem. That is to say, every, everyone from the protocol level uh, to the wallet level, to the uh, business that is bringing a Web3 experience to their customers has some responsibility to make it easier to onboard, right? So like, you know, the fact that a private key controls all of my funds, um, not necessarily the best experience if I want to, you know, have a loyalty program or a loyalty uh, reward at, at Starbucks. I actually, yeah, and I think that sort of on that point, um, 
when it comes to onboarding folks into a new technology or onto a new platform, I think that the most people get onboarded when the technology becomes invisible. And what I mean by that is if we think about, uh, uh, Kaylin, you mentioned your mom um, and her, like onboarding her onto Web3. Uh, let's say that she uses uh, Facebook or Twitter. What's nice about Facebook or Twitter is that Facebook is just Facebook. It's not a PHP cloud-based social network. It's just Facebook. Um, and I think that's because the focus becomes on what the technology does for people, not necessarily how it works. So I think that the really great business uh, adoption stories of crypto will actually be, you'll actually have to look for them because no, because crypto won't be in the headline, right? In the, in the press release, it's not going to say so-and-so business releases crypto-based thing. It's going to say business releases thing and it's awesome. And then like somewhere in paragraph seven, how does it work? Oh, it uses these constructs from this technology, which is really, really cool, right? I think that th this is something that it's, with, with any new technology, right, it's, it's very exciting at first and it's very interesting and there are all of these, you know, futuristic ideas. But when we think about overall utility, like right now we're on a webcast and I have no idea which internet connection uh, you guys are on, but we can still chat face to face, right? And it's by not having to know about all of those details, but still having a much better user experience. I think that's what true onboarding is going to look like. So... It, it kind of just comes back to people will get onboarded when people make things that kind of give them superpowers and they don't even really need to know about the intricacies or private keys or EOAs or reorgs. Basically, when people can take their property and take their things with them, you know, from one brand to another, from one country to another, without really thinking about walled gardens, I think that's what the, you know, the true onboarding will actually be. Yeah, I think I, responsibility... I Oh, sorry. Every time I get you, I think responsibility might. Be, sorry, I think responsibility might be the wrong word too, right? It's it's whose opportunity is it? Because responsibility makes it feel like, hey, this thing has to happen. One of us has to make this happen, and that feels a little bit rushed and like we're forcing it on someone. It's more like, you know, if I'm going to launch something, then it's my opportunity to make that onboarding process as simple as possible. If I'm doing something behind the scenes, which can eventually make this invisible, then it's my opportunity to do that because I'll, I'll, I'll benefit from that. And I think that's the, that's the part where as a, you know, the people who are, you know, leery of web three or haven't discovered it yet, it, if it feels like work or like a job or, Hey, you can, you can play around with this, but then it's your responsibility to then onboard your friends. That's when it gets a little strange. So I think, I think it's cause we're so early and we're waiting for things to happen. It feels like that, but yeah, like Omar said, I think once we, once we don't realize what's happening um, and more people have, you know, more companies and have figured out like, here's where we can provide something useful. Then all of a sudden there'll be like, you know, frictionless to start participating and lots of things to interact with, whether you know you're doing it or not, that would be, that would be exciting. But I feel like a lot of the pressure right now, especially in the bear market is everyone going, who's going to do this? Who's going to, who's going to save us? Who's going to bring everyone on? And everyone's just going to keep, looking at looking in circles until um you know but it's it's also a great opportunity for for uh for people that are curious so i i agree with uh, omar and nick and some of the comments that they made and i wanted to share uh two examples of things i think are really cool in the space for bringing on a broader group of people and uh colin you talked about your mom so we actually designed something with Blue Studios, which I love. It's a female founded company, Blue Studios. And uh, we're working with them on something called the Wallio Wallet. And the cool thing about it is it has permissions for up to eight people in the wallet. And it's designed as a family wallet. So grandma, grandpa, mom and dad, aunts and uncles, kids all participate and leverage a single wallet, the family wallet. Um, I love it because, um, you know, as you're looking at the screens, so if someone tries to buy an NFT, like uh, we were looking at one example where a grandpa was trying to buy an NFT for five ETH because, you know, five ETH is like $5. And his grandson was like, oh, no, grandpa, don't do that. That's like, five, that's like a lot of money. Um, and so the interesting learning we had is we thought actually the parents or aunts and uncles would be training the kids. We have a learn to earn piece of it, but actually the kids 
are teaching the parents and the grandparents. We also uh, came up with a family DAL template inside of it. So I think that makes it fun. Uh, what we're also hearing is it brings families together, like grandparents are actually talking to grandkids because of this family wallet. People are interested in it. Like they want to discover it. They want to learn about it. Um, and then the second thing that we did is we launched a group called Unstoppable Women of Web3. Um, so we found, you know, obviously in the space, there's only 8% women today in the space, but we found a lot of women interested in it, but they didn't know how to get started. So we launched a set of education streams like Web3, Metaverse, Creator, if you're creating something, um, fashion, so that you could go and learn about it for free. Um, at the end of the class, you get a NFT bag. Maybe some connection problems there. We wanted to uh, proceed forward. And then yesterday, we actually just announced our classes in Spanish. We had so much demand for Latinas. We announced the, the classes for Spanish. And our goal is to train um, 5 million Latina women uh, in this space because they're so interested in it, but in their native tongue as well. Awesome. I will pitch the idea of a family dad to my mom next time I see her and see how that goes down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah why not but uh let's change track slightly and kind of talk about how businesses can make this happen right what's the sort of nitty-gritty kind of things they need to think about if they want to launch in web3 um my first question is where does web3 fall in like the traditional company structure is it the tech team is it marketing who who's looking at this I'll start. I think um, it depends on the organization, right? Like if you're a Burger King, it's gonna probably fall on marketing, right? If you are, um, you know, like like an Olive Garden, it might fall more in tech, right? Or whoever handles the loyalty. Um, yeah, I think uh, it's it's more more than likely gonna be different for every single company. Um, in some companies, it might be like a auditing or compliance team that is, you know, trying to, to get data from Web3 to ensure that customers or clients or whatever other, other, or, or other parts of the same organization are actually in compliance. So, you know, I, I think you're just going to see a lot of different departments making use of it because it is general purpose technology. Yeah, I think I think it should be you know a combination of two departments, whichever one they are. The first one saying why why are we why are we doing this, and then the second one that decides why would anyone externally want to interact with us that way, right? So that'll depend on depend on the industry you're in and the and the and the company and, and the product building. But those are the you know those are always the, the riskiest parts of something new. Is people are like I got, we got to do it, we got to do it, and they just do something. But you know I think if it's um it's fun to build stuff and it's not that fun when you build something that no one wants and it's not that fun to, um, you know, say you're offering something that someone wants, but not have built, you know, a version that, that people wanted. So I think that's the, um, that's the most basic level is like whoever in the company can answer those two questions and then probably take the normal path within that company. I'm, I'm with Nick on that one as well. Like, I, I think the answer is let's say that a company was to do this initiative, but they were to do it on the internet or, or if they were to just do it through like direct mail even. Um, it, and if you, had, if you had to answer the question of, okay, which, which organization or which group would lead it then, I think it would, the answer would largely be like that group. I think it's good to have support from folks who have you know, used non-fungible tokens before, who've, who've interacted with blockchains before, but I think the most important thing is that, you know, we can keep creating new technologies, but at the end of the day, the user utility has to be there. So I think the group that understands the user and that use case the most should be the one. Like, let's say we're talking about uh, a brand loyalty program that uh, is to be made stronger. I think the group that traditionally handles that should be the one that leads it because there are going to be a thousand and one questions about how we implement this thing, which blockchain we should use, whether it should be, you know, soul bound or transferable. Like, there are going to be so many of these questions and it's 
almost impossible to just get them all right. And the only question or the best question whenever you're faced with a question like that is like, does the user really care? What does the user actually want? Or how does this make the user's life more awesome? So whoever can answer that question the best, whichever group in an organization ha like, you know, has the most intuitive understanding should be the one to do it. Um, it's almost like saying, yeah, if, if instead of using NFTs, we used the regular internet, who would do it? And I think it should be that group. I think it should be those groups, but I don't think all the time it is those groups. So I'm getting a lot of reach out from companies asking for help. Like, how do I get started? Um, you know, especially since I came in from Amazon Web Services, I have a lot of customers. They're all really curious about it. Um, I would say right now, the most reach outs I have is from either a chief strategy officer or a chief innovation officer. And they're looking at it as kind of their next big thing, right? And so I think that that jives Nick and Omar and Austin with some of the stuff you talked about, like who's looking at that next thing. Um, I would say the second reach out I'm getting is from IP and attorneys, which I know sounds quite strange, but everybody's worried about, okay, your digital identity, um, how is that trademarked? Who owns it, right? Um, so I think I'm, I'm getting a lot of reach out from attorneys, IP, trademark folks. And then the third group, I'm getting a lot of reach outs from our chief marketing officers. Everybody wants to know how I can use it. And what I've been trying to talk to them about is you don't want to use it for just like a, a one and done scenario. You really need to think through the use cases that Omar, Nick and Austin talked about. That for me is the right way to focus on it. Versus some of these others, you know, I just want to explore the future or I need to protect my trademark. I think the right way to look at it is customer obsessed. What does your customer want to do and how could this technology be used more to help you reach that goal? Hey, if you can't service those people that are uh, wondering about getting started that are former AWS people, send them my way. <laughs> okay, we might have to team up on that, Austin. We'll see. <laughs> it kind of leads me into my next question, which is, you know, a lot of people, I think, at this stage are, you know, looking to outsource a lot of this to Web3 companies who know what they're doing. Um, what should businesses who want to take that route be doing to ensure they're working with the best partners? Um, what sort of qualifications and experience in services should they be looking for? I would say that I, 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 I imagine um, Austin, Nick and Sandy have more comprehensive answers for this one. But I think something really important in this space, especially when evaluating outside vendors, is how long does it take a vendor to say that they don't know the answer to a certain question? And the reason why is because uh, there's, there's no such thing as like a Web3 expert with uh, 20 years of experience because the Bitcoin white paper was like 2008, 2009. So people know what they're doing to varying degrees, but the space moves so rapidly. Like I was at Coinbase and I led the new assets group for three years. And even there, I felt like I was being left behind and I felt like I wasn't able to keep up with the latest and greatest. So the space moves so quickly. And if you meet someone in crypto who you know, has an answer to every single question, who doesn't know the limits of their understanding, that might be someone who's so set in their own ways because it moves so much more quickly than the traditional business environment does. It moves so much more quickly than, than, than normal things do. So I would almost find a way to make sure that any partner you do work with has uh, this, you know, self understanding that the space moves very quickly. And a lot of the service that they're offering to your firm is the ability to keep apprised and keep up with these things. And that starts with a lot of, you know, I don't know, or that's a good question. I should figure that out or, you know, just general curiosity. Hmm. I would say that um, my advice would be because of the strong community in Web3, I think it's great when companies are just starting to partner up with someone in the Web3 space. So, you know, uh, to most part, point, no, not someone who is a know-it-all, but someone who can bring in an understanding and a credibility uh, to introduce what you want to do with your community to um, this web three world, because I do believe the community is so strong 
and that if you have a misstep, it's it's really painful because the community will um, will act as a community and therefore reject it. I've seen some big missteps that should be avoided. And I think if in particular, some of the Web2 companies would partner with a Web3 company, I think it's very helpful. So, you know, some great examples that I've seen, um, you know, Polygon with Starbucks, you know, Polygon has a lot of credibility in the space. They're really strong. So they're, uh, you know, they're working really well together. I think Nike did a great acquisition in the Web3 space. I think that's helped them to understand what's really uh, what's really happening uh, in the space. So I think as companies come together and they're leveraging, you know, look at Lazy Lions and Puma, for example. I think that that was a great partnership. I do believe that partnering with a strong Web3 company is a is a is the right move. Yeah, I think. I think from our experience, right, it's, it's got to be um, a lot of communication, like way more communication than at other times, because things do move so fast and and people are figuring it out as they go along. And so it's one of those things you can't really say, hey, yep, today we agree, let's build this. And then it's going to take, OK, it's going to take 90 days. Great. See you in 90 days, because somewhere along the way, someone's going to pop up who built some piece of that that's already like, oh, shit, they made that a lot of shoot. They made that a lot easier or. Um, or we hadn't looked at it that way. Um, and so, or there's going to be, you know, you're following it faster and the person building is just trying to learn and build. And then you're saying, oh, hey, that's going to be obsolete, right? So the worst case scenario would be partner with someone, create a plan based on today, and then just leave them to go away and do it. I think you're taking a big chance that by the time you you put something live, it's it's no longer relevant or exciting. Um, and that's really hard to deal with. <laughs> like it's, 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 expensive right there's a lot of times where you're like all right well great glad we tried to figure that out for the last few weeks but someone over there figured it out more efficiently so scrap that or hey that opportunity is gone or hey we need to tweak that so i think communication is going to be the is going to be the biggest part whether you have someone internally or externally that can lead that conversation it's just um it's just crazy how fast everything happens it's really hard to um it's hard to predict what's going to happen which makes it very hard to predict that what you're building is going to be as exciting when it launches as it is today. So that's a, actually, that's a I, I, I want to add, I, I want to add one point to that as well. It's like, it moves so quickly. And, and something that's a little bit paradoxical is um, if, if you think about moving quickly in like a traditional web sense, like let's say a competitor launches something and um, they bring it to market. It's like, if a competitor launches something that, generally doesn't have that much upside for, for, you know, for yourself as a firm, but in web three, because it's open, um, like, let's say we're talking about somebody releasing a smart contract and another company launches a smart contract. What's really interesting about that is in order for that contract to really be accepted by the community, it has to be open source. It has to be published on GitHub so that people can audit the code themselves and review it and really, you know, trust and understand what it does. So there's something really interesting here where a lot of companies are competing with one another to make the best thing for the end user. Everyone is competing for these customers, but in the process of doing that, they're open sourcing and making available a lot of their core intellectual property. Things like the actual brand is, is, is kind of another, you know, class of intellectual property as a whole. But when it comes to things like, uh, like source code, things actually required to run a smart contract, it's 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 pretty impressive how open the community is and how willing people are to share with one another. Like a couple of months ago, I did a project with Uniswap where I wrote the uh, Uniswap V3 liquidity mining contract. And I think at its peak that that was holding probably like probably like eight figures worth of, uh, of, of, of different currencies. And what's so interesting after that project in my head, I never said, oh, what if I didn't open source this project? Like, in order for something to succeed, it has to be open, it has to be shared, and people have to be able to see it, trust it, and verify it. So there are just all of these really interesting questions that show up around what, in, you know, what ends up being the very, very intellectual property. Also through that vein, the one other thought I wanted to share is that I think that for almost all things that end up being successful brands and campaigns in Web3, they're almost always thought of as an amalgamation of other Lego bricks. Let's say that I was speaking with a firm and they said that they wanted to do a project. And the first thing they wanted to do was rewrite, you know, uh, the ERC 721 standard, the NFT standard from scratch. I would 
kind of say instantly no because so many of these great building blocks already exist. So I would definitely, definitely, definitely find people who prioritize building, but at the same time understand that so many of the great things are already open source and their jobs are to integrate existing things as opposed to starting from scratch and reinventing the wheel. Obviously, people will eventually need to reinvent the wheel. They'll need to do things that are very, very custom. But it's just amazing how much you can do to get started with open source components that are already available on GitHub. I think my answer to this question uh, really depends on the size of the organization and the size of the budget. If you're like, let's say, uh, Miami Heat, you know, you would probably want to go to a consulting firm that has like a pretty strong group focused on blockchain. My personal favorite here is Young EY. They have a really great blockchain uh, focused department. Um, but if you're all around, a lot of what everyone else said uh, tends, tends to make sense. Um, you're going to want to find someone who ideally has deployed things and uh, had some degree of success before. And if you're, you know, at a loss because you have some new idea that hasn't been done before, uh, you should reach out to probably one of the people on this uh, on this on this uh, webinar. You know, they, they, all of us will probably be able to point you in the in the right direction or in some direction. Uh, I suppose um, leading on from that, when brands do approach, um, you know, third parties to help with their Web three projects, what do they want? Like. Are they wanting NFT drops? Are they wanting metaverse hubs? What are like the common sort of projects they want to take part in? Typical, typical projects that I've seen right now uh, are the easiest for people to focus in on. Um, so I would say what I've seen are people experimenting with NFT tickets. Uh, take the Super Bowl, for instance, or a lot of music festivals. It's just the form of an NFT, but an NFT of value, a collectible, which is a ticket um, or just an NFT, you know, overall. I've seen um, companies experiment with loyalty programs, Starbucks being, you know, a big one case in point, but there are others out there. I think experimentation with loyalty is going to even grow bigger as we proceed forward. Um, activity in the metaverse. I mean, look at Decentraland with their fashion show, how many fashion brands came in, um, Hermes, Chanel, Gucci, all experimenting with what this could be, what it could look like as they move forward. And then just kind of building a headquarters. We built a headquarters in Decentraland to learn. We're seeing a lot of people build. There's not a lot of users in Decentraland yet, but I see a lot of people buying land, experimenting with how you build, what you build, what's a good location, um, that sort of thing. And then, of course, for my business on digital identity, um, I see a lot of Web2 companies coming to me, a lot of them wanting not just their, their brand to use for their Web3 digital identity, but all of their sub-brands as well. So I was just working with a large Web2 company that you know, uh, we were looking to give them their digital identity, but then they said, oh, and I've got 1700 sub brands that I need protected too. So um, we're also seeing almost that digital identity as the gateway into the next generation of the internet. And a lot of brands thinking about that first uh, as more of a protection versus, uh, you know, let me go and expand and do the marketing around it. So that's what I've seen, metaverse, ticketing, NFTs, you know, practice building protection of digital identities. Uh, we're seeing a lot of custody, like how can I custody funds for my customers and a lot of um, enrichment, how can I enrich my customer profiles and uh, NFTs, tokens and DeFi things generally. Yeah, for... I mean, I'm in a small, you know, smaller space with smaller, you know, brands or brands that are outside of the NFT space. And the most common thing is like, how would I, what's the first step, right? And I, I was, I think my advice is always the first step is the thing we, the thing we can't do in the future is yesterday, right? So even just basic things like commemorating, you know, like, hey, I was here yesterday, right? Whether it's in, in a little collection that just says I was early and I was, I was that early or hey on this date we did this thing it seems trivial but it's very simple and it's a very lightweight way for for you know fans of a brand to understand like oh okay 
why would I, how would I get this and why would I get this? And it could just be as simple as just just to say, you know, just to prove you were here. And in the future, there may be some utility added to it. But I think it's like, you know, I tend to always overcomplicate what someone can do who's not really going to be a, become a Web3 company in the next X years. They're just trying to do something fun and simple and, and find, find out their why, right? And the why would be, it's going to be a distraction in a lot of times to try to do something to try to figure out if that makes sense for your brand. But it's just very simple things like um, launch a collection that's just, you know, I, would, I mean, I think Angel City, the soccer team, right, did one just saying, hey, let's commemorate our first game. You have an NFT from our first game. Like, it's just so basic. But even a few months removed, that would be like, ah, you know what? That'd be kind of cool to have that, um, to have that, you know, especially if you were there, right? Or, so I think it's, um, I think it depends kind of back to the thing. It's like the scale of companies. You guys are talking to larger companies with more ambitious plans. But I think at the, at the broader, smaller company scale, it's like, you don't need a ton of technology or a ton of experience to just something on brand that's on the blockchain at a certain date and time could be all that you need to kind of get that first little wave going. It's about sort of making that first step then, I guess. Um, yeah, something cool. painless, right? You're not gonna, you, know, you know, just take a little step, a little tiny step forward where people can, uh, you know, the person next to you can say, come on, let's take this little step forward and there, what do I got to do? Just, just this, you know, and it, it, why am it, I doing it? Just to take a step forward. <laughs> yeah. And, and just to compliment what Nick is saying, you know, it's really interesting, I think, um, to see how many customers or companies though are interested in doing something. Um, I was just at a web two conference. I was just at fortune, most powerful women, uh, over the last couple of days. And so, you know, you get like the who's who of all these companies, mostly over dinner or lunch or breakfast, every company was like asking me, okay, what can I do? Like, how could I get started? Like, I want to do something in the space. I don't want to be left behind, you know, including universities and city and state governments. I mean, it, it's pretty um, fascinating that even though we're in a bear market, there is still so much interest in doing something in this particular space. Yeah, I wanted to, to, to say plus one to that. And I think there's something interesting about building in the bear market. Um, in general, um, if you look at the really successful companies, whether it's web or really in any industry, like a lot of the best companies get started and get built during bear markets. And one of the reasons why is because when everything is growing really, really quickly and there's, you know, 100% year over year growth in prices and whatnot, you'll succeed no matter what. And you might succeed in spite of yourself, not necessarily because of your own efforts. So there's this interesting dynamic where projects that get started now and succeed are more likely to have succeeded because of their own efforts. So to kind of like take that all the way home is like, when is the best time to start something like yesterday? When is the second best time, you know, in a bear market? Because it's a really good filter for making things work. Definitely. Um, so I was hoping to do the last 10 minutes and have like a Q&A from the audience, but nobody has answered, asked any questions. Um, <laughs> yeah, if you, <laughs> if you want to ask a question, um, there's a little button that you can use in the bottom right hand of your screen. Um, but I will kick it off and ask a question of my own. Um, metaverse hubs. I mean, this is something that really fascinates me. Um, you know, to most, I go to Decentraland a lot and I kind of walk around these hubs and they're cool, but like they're kind of empty. Um, I'm just kind of interested in what do you think about, you know, companies that build metaverse hubs and how can they make them successful? I can speak to that one um, qu quickly, which is the idea that when you measure the success of any project, like a metaverse hub, you could choose to measure like, you know, the, you know, MAU, like monthly active user count, for example. And that is one way that you could measure it. You could also, but it's also really interesting to look and see if there's a small concentration of users that are really, really engaged, right? Like if you consider something where every month, like maybe 10% of the users account for like 90 or 95% of the usage, I think it's interesting to kind of like double click on that 10% and double down and figure out what they're doing because you may have found product market fit 
in that use case specifically, but not necessarily in the broad one. And I think like the very, you know, large scale metaverse hub sort of as people are intending will probably emerge from like a small, you know, metaverse hub, which starts with really just like one or two individuals just interacting there. So it's like start small and then let it grow big instead of starting and like on day one, just looking at very, very high level aggregate metrics. Um, yeah, sorry, Sandy, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, I think that everybody is experimenting today. So I think you need to determine what your goals are. Like, why are you setting up something in Decentraland, for example? Because we know there aren't that many people there yet. Are your goals aligned with what you're trying to do? So I would actually say, even though I don't know if they call it the metaverse, but like Epic Games is doing some epic things with what I would call the metaverse. I mean, their concerts, their, their concerts in the metaverse are packed houses. Um, so if you're looking for a lot of engagement and users as your metric, I think that that's a, that's a great way to look at who's doing well, who's got the traction. A lot of games today are ahead of the other spaces, and I would consider games part of metaverses as well. So I think you really, you know, for any brand looking at going into this space, I think you need to define how would you determine success? So we launched our headquarters in the metaverse for our uh, Unstoppable Women of Web3. And we had goals of one, building community with our members, um, two, learning about what it took to build the metaverse, and three, educating others and how to build an avatar and how to get started in the metaverse. And for us, we exceeded on all three of those goals. I wouldn't say that we had thousands and thousands of people there, but like for our kickoff, we were hoping for about 200 women to come in and to learn more by creating their avatar and actually doing it, not listening to someone lecture, but actually getting in there and learning and doing. So I think it's really important as you're looking at some of these experiments that you look at your goals and what you're hoping to get out of it. And I advise um, customers to do different things based on what they're looking for. Um, so I know, um, Kathy Hackle and Journey worked on the metaverse uh, space, and they had very specific goals for what they were looking for, reaching a particular audience and a particular um, segment, a particular age group, a particular buying profile. So they were very specific in how they were going to look at success or non-success. And I think that's really important for any brand trying to do anything in the space. Yeah, I think, I think for us, we, you know, even as a startup, we looked at it as there is no place that I'm aware of where there's millions of users just waiting to be shown something, right? It's like, it's it's basically like, I had a friend, this company, he's like, we're going to build in this um, in sandbox because that's where all the users are. I'm like, I don't know how many users are in there. You know, it's you're going to have to build stuff now and you're going to be building in front of some smaller audiences, but that's that's okay. And you have to be okay with being out there and understanding that you want to be getting better so that when the masses come, you're not learning as much or in front of the mass. You've got a better product ready for them, right? And that's going to be part of the reason they're going to come is because there's going to be a better product. And part of the reason they're going to interact with your product is because it's going to be a better product. So it's that weird transparency. Everyone can see what you're doing. Everyone can, you know, like you just have to become comfortable with that. And so I think without that, why, if it's just like, trying to capitalize on an amazing opportunity that exists today, it gets a little tricky. You kind of find yourself like, and it's a, it's a, it's a weird, it's, you know, everyone's self-conscious. So you look at it and you go, Oh my God, this is only happening in front of this many people or, or, Hey, people, people aren't, you know, interacting with this the way we had hoped, but then it's like, okay, well, that's just the good thing about it is, well, that's the reality. So now you move on to tomorrow and we figure out, okay, what can we change? What can we learn from the people that are using it to make it, you know, what, what, you know, friction can we reduce? And so that's the, um, that's the exciting part. But I, yeah, I, I, I think it's kind of one of those, where is everyone? Well, there's, everyone's not as big yet as we want. Everyone's looking at it, but not everyone's, you know, it's kind of like, I guess that's like having a bar, right? And there's a ton of people walking up and down the street but they're not quite sure where to go yet, which one to, you know, there's not a, there's not an extensive um, rating system or 
you know, where they're looking for a restaurant, there's not, a, there's not as many user reviews as they'd all like. So they just kind of don't know that place looks a little daunting. Should I go in there? And then, so, but yeah, I've kind of lost the plot. I got to say, Austin, we should put, I want we need to attach music to your, just the feed of your, um, your video. Cause with that background, it almost seems like a, uh, like a photo shoot or a, um, or a music video. I think if you just played music with you moving around with that thing, it would actually be probably pretty good content. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah. I mean, and I guess with the bar analogy, right? Like even if people are trying to walking down the street looking for a bar, they're never going to choose the empty lot, right? Um, yeah. Or they will, but, every, every bar starts empty, right? You just gotta, someone's gotta come in and then people have to see them having fun or see them leaving and going, hey, what was it like in there? And they're like, oh, it was awesome. Why are you leaving? Well, it's, you know, four in the morning, I gotta go home. That's different than, you know, well, it's nine o'clock and it was kind of dead in there, you know? So we gotta get to that point um, slowly. Yeah, definitely. Um, we've got a couple of questions. Um, I'm gonna go with the one that's got an upvote. Um, what's the biggest untapped opportunity that you see for small businesses in Web3? And what about large businesses? And that's from uh, Nora Chan. I would I love can, to start um, on this one. Go for it. Uh, go for it. Cool. Yeah. Um, I think one of my favorite kinds of small businesses is uh, restaurants. And um, where I live in Miami, it's getting harder and harder to actually go in without a reservation. So I think a, a very big opportunity, maybe not the largest, but uh, a very big opportunity for small businesses like restaurants is making reservations NFTs because it opens up the secondary market revenue stream. If I want to buy a reservation from someone the day of, I can just go on, I don't know, OpenSea, Magic Eden, whatever, and buy it uh, rather than, um, you know, not being able to eat at the restaurant I want to eat at. And this is already sort of happening, not uh, with NFTs, but just by finance bros in New York who are financializing uh, restaurant reserve reservations by creating markets for them. Yeah, one, um, one, one, one thought that I wanted to add that's, that's actually related to that is, um, I think that some really interesting trends are, when you think about small businesses and large businesses, it's an interesting distinction. What I get really excited about are what, you know, who are small business owners that want to become owners of large businesses? How do we help a small business become a large one? And how do we help them make that transition? Very often, the difference is going to be scale and distribution and reach. And the fact that if you are a restaurant, for example, you're kind of constrained to your local geography. You're, uh, you know, specifically where you are. And it's, you won't get someone from like across the country to come to your restaurant. But when you really think about what a restaurant is, it's the food, it's the experience, but it's also the brand. So I think that there are a lot of really interesting opportunities to take really, really, really high quality small businesses, give them global reach, and maybe eventually become a large business um, in, in ways that couldn't have been done before. Yeah, it was interesting because at this conference I was just at, the uh, SBA just presented on the top three challenges that small businesses have today. Uh, one is preserving a good reputation, which I think would be a great use case for, um, you know, using badging and profiling and reputation er elements of Web3. Um, the second is in retaining and upskilling their employees which you know we've been we've been working on a way to provide certificates uh, and training for free to employees. I think that would be a really interesting one because most of the education she said that employees are looking for is not specifically in what they're doing, but more about you know leadership or new trends or that kind of um, of a of a you know of attrition. And then the third one is how do I get po more powerful buying power? How do I, um, how am I able to influence my supplier so I can get my cost down so I can maximize my profit? And here, I, again, I love what that pizza Dow did in assembling all these small businesses to get that buying power, much like the Constitution Dow did, right, where they, they presented themselves as a single buyer to buy the Constitution. The pizza Dow assembled all these small companies. So I think for the top three challenges that small businesses have today, Web3 could play a role in helping to address all three of those. 
So. Yeah, it's interesting. Even as you guys talk, like I'm, mind is spinning um, because even the just the how do you how could you use Web three to go from small to large? You know, like we have a coffee concept, and we were talking about it yesterday. And like, well, wh why can't we build the why can't we build the next Starbucks? Right? Why can't we build the 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 next big coffee chain? And we start looking at it like you know you go through those delusional but aspirational conversations, and then you or not delusional, at the moment delusional, but then you, um, so then you think to yourself, like you look at Web3 and you go, oh, we can est establish this brand, but I hadn't really thought about it until right now about, okay, you can use, you can integrate Web3 in a lightweight way to help build the brand and kind of seed the foundation for more in the future. But I hadn't thought about, well, how could we integrate it now at the formation launch stage to potentially have it, a separate path. We're just looking down for like, how will this help us connect, grow, expand our footprint, you know, more rapidly than we, than we could without it. So I think that's, that's really interesting. Um, points that you guys, that you guys brought up that I'm sitting here kind of in real time trying to apply to like, Hey, don't forget this before, uh, before, the, before the end of the conversation. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, unfortunately it is the end of the conversation. Um, I want to apologize to Nora and Victor that we, Nora, that I didn't get to your other question and Victor that I didn't get to yours in the chat. Um, but thank you so much, um, Omar, Sandy, Nick, Austin, for uh, taking part and giving your insight. And thank you to everyone who uh, joined and stayed watching until the end. Um, you know, wherever you are, have a great morning, afternoon, and evening. Great. Thank you again so much for having us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yep.